Welcome to the Bothell City Council meeting of January 9th, uh, 2018. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All council members are here except Deputy Mayor and Council Member McAuliffe. They're both absent and excused. Uh, the meeting agenda approval, is there any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? I had just one quick thing. Um, I was hoping we can just do a, a moment of silence for Deputy McCartney. Um, he was a deputy with the Pierce County uh, Police Department since 2014. He was killed in the line of duty. Uh, he leaves behind him a wife and, and three sons. So if we can just give them a moment of silence. All right, thank you. Uh, so visitor comment section, the, I always read out of the protocol manual. Um, each person addressing the council will give him his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record, and unless the council grants further time, shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than, other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion either directly or through a member of the council without the permission of the mayor. And the first one I have is Steve Holmes. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Steve Holmes. I'm uh, president of uh, What's Up Stand Up Paddle Kayak at uh, Bothell Landing. I want to kind of reintroduce myself since we have a lot of new staff and new council, which is all good to see. Um, kind of give a kind of a background of my history um, involved with the city. Um, back in uh, 2010, I had approached the city on the idea of offering a kayak rental. And uh, they were real reluctant because of uh, all the construction and we're moving the highway, but we went ahead and did it. And so we got successful at it and it's going well, as many of you know. Um, shortly after uh, Kenmore got um, really interested in our operation, so we opened up there in 2013. Uh, we we're connecting the cities by way of bicycles and kayaks. So actually people could paddle from one location to the other, drop off or rent a bike and get it on the way back. Um, we look forward to all the new parks. We're looking forward to being involved with Wayne's Golf Course one day, and that's probably way down the road. Um, but I have other ideas and I've, people in the city have been talking about it, and I have been talking about it for years. Um, my history is I'm a ship's captain for 37 years, um, operated many vessels. So our long-term goal to help bring people into the city is to offer a passenger vessel, commercial passenger vessel, running the Sammamish River. And I have already identified a vessel that I'm gonna be flying out to Florida to go look at. It's gonna be built there, and it's gonna be brought over here. Um, we're looking at that in, in a couple of years. Uh, Kenmore is showing high interest in this idea and um, so Kenmore would be a, a great stop. So would the new park um, one day. Bothell Landing would be another great stop. So you can think of it as a shuttle or just a tour or both. Um, so our plan is as we get um, okays and permits, there's a lot to look into on making this happen. But my, in my mind, I could see this happening uh, in 2019. Uh, the boat's going to take about six months to build. It'll have a head, um, other word, restroom on board. It'll be uh, designed for the Sammamish River for height and maneuverability. Uh, it'll be a 16 to 20 passenger. It all depends when the boat gets to this side. Sector 13, the U.S. Coast Guard, will recertify it for Washington waters and then they decide how many passenger vessel it will be. But when it leaves Florida, Florida is already saying it's an 18 passenger, but the numbers could change. So anyways, um, wanna connect cities by the way of motorboat next. And I uh, thank you for your time 
And if you have any questions, I'll be easy to find. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that, that would like to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into the uh, study session. So we'll go into AB 18-003, the Growth Management Act, the Imagine Both Comprehensive Plan, and the planning process overview. Um, just kind of a, a quick thing. <clears throat> uh, as a council, study sessions, we've we've managed them a specific way in the past, and I would like to change that as of today if, if everybody's comfortable with it. And what I would like to do is that no longer do you need to get the attention of the chair during the meeting, but you can just get the attention of the presenter and 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 ask your questions directly. So it's, it's less formal. I actually intentionally did not wear a suit today just to try to say like, hey, during study sessions, let's not worry so much about having Robert's rules of order and like trying to actually study and, and work, uh, communicate freely and that type of thing. If we if we fall back to where, you know, somebody dominates a lot of the meeting or um, people are, are need to be basically, we need to reinstate the Robert's rules of order, we can do that. But I just wanted to give it a, a try if everybody's, if everybody's okay with that, okay. A lot of cities do it this way. It's not anything bizarre. It's just uh, we haven't done it in the past, and I'd just like to change that with this new council, at least try it. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Hassler, the interim uh, planning, public, planning public works. I just gave you a two department. <laughs> planning and community development director. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening, council. And uh, with me tonight are um, senior planners Jeff Smith, Bruce Blackburn, and Dave Boyd. Um, I think you probably all know uh, Dave and Bruce pretty well, but Jeff works in the background for us in community development, in development review. Um, so you're, you're probably less familiar with his face, although you, you may know him. Uh, but anyway, there's a team of, us, of four of us here tonight. Uh, we have a three-part presentation for you. I'm going to give the first part, Dave will give the second part, and Jeff the third part. And Bruce is our, our go-to, um, Alex Trebek. So um, thank you for the opportunity to come and present this to you tonight. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, I think it gives uh, the council the opportunity, number one, to see what we do in community development, and number two, to hopefully understand how planning at the very highest level in the state of Washington, starting with the Growth Management Act, works its way down through everything we do to everyday review of, for example, building permits. So hopefully when we're finished, you'll have a sense for that. And of course, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. This is a three-part um, uh, presentation. So Mayor, at your discretion, if council would like to ask their questions during each part uh, or at the end, uh, we're open to whatever you would like to do. So we'll uh, start off, I'm gonna start at the highest level, um, at least in Washington State. Um, so the direction that we take ultimately for planning uh, is through the Growth Management Act and everyone refers to it simply as the GMA. So I'll give you a brief history and overview. Um, we'll talk a little bit about something called Vision 2040, a little bit about countywide planning policies, growth targets, and buildable lands analyses. So these are all tasks that, um, that we, we undertake um, as a city that trickle down or inform um, or guide our comprehensive planning process and then ultimately trickle down to our development review um, process. So the Growth Management Act essentially was a response to population growth and environmental degradation. Um, during the 60s, 70s and particularly during the 1980s, uh, there was a real uh, a movement, a feel within Washington State that that growth needed to be managed rather than just allowed to happen. Other states, such as Florida, had already tackled growth management and Oregon, um, and those two states were used as something of a model for Washington's Growth Management Act, although there are key differences between them. The GMA addresses issues by requiring communities most affected by growth to adopt 20-year comprehensive plans to anticipate that growth, guide development, and concentrate it into urban areas. So. Urban areas essentially for us mean within the urban growth area boundaries, and we'll talk about urban growth area boundaries a little bit later in the presentation. In addition, cities and counties must adopt development regulations that protect environmental and natural resource areas. And uh, later in the presentation, Jeff will talk about how we do that a little bit. So the Growth Management Act was passed by the state legislature in 1990 and codified primarily in RCW Chapter 36.70A. And it's a legislative policy document, so it provides legislative policy guidance to communities. It contains 14 goals, and I'm not going to read all of this, um, but I'll run over the goals very quickly. 
uh, urban growth, reduced sprawl, a transportation goal, there's a housing goal, a goal for economic development, a goal directed for property rights, uh, permit issuance, natural resource industries, open space and recreation, environment, citizen participation, public facilities and services, historic preservation, and shoreline management. Uh, and importantly, the legislature did not prioritize any of these goals. Rather, they recognized that each community would emphasize them differently when conflicts arose. And if you uh, simply look at the, the title of each of those goals, you'll recognize immediately that there are conflicts within each of those goals. For example, there is a goal to protect property rights. There is a goal to protect the environment. Those are often in conflict with each other. The way cities and communities decide how to prioritize those goals is through our comprehensive plan and the policies contained within that and then our regulations. So under the GMA, um, uh, King and Snohomish counties, which, which of course Bothell is a part of, are what are known as fully planning communities. So the basic mandate for fully planning communities is to adopt development regulations that protect critical areas and natural resource areas, plus adopt county-wide planning policies, a comprehensive plan, and again, development regulations that achieve uh, the above. The way that the, the region that we are in, the four county region of King, Snohomish, uh, Pierce, and Kitsap counties has elected to uh, go about trickling down the goals of the Growth Management Act to a regional level is through a process called Vision 2040. And this is a, a regional growth strategy it's, um, it's managed by the Puget Sound Regional Council, PSRC, and again, it includes King, Snohomish, Pierce, and Kitsap counties, and the communities within them. The overarching goal is to accommodate future population and employment growth in a way that minimizes adverse impacts on the environment. So all the way through this, you see there's already a theme that, has, that talks about environmental degradation. Some of the key principles of Vision 2040 are to focus growth into cities, Again, that's that urban growth area um, uh, policy. And then within, within cities, concentrate jobs, housing, and other activities in centers where possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about regional growth centers in, in just a, a minute. Vision 2040 operates uh, on a regional geography basis. And essentially, the region, the four-county region, is divided into metropolitan cities. So there are five of them. So Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, Bellevue, and Bremerton. Uh, there are 14 core cities spread throughout the region. Uh, Bothell is a core city, and what designates a core city is having a regional growth center. Um, as I think all of you are aware, our regional growth center is designated as the Canyon Park area. Um, and one of the items that you're going to be seeing a lot of in the next year, um, both in your goal setting, budget process, and, and uh, overall planning um, aspects, are the Canyon Park Regional Gro Growth Center. Uh, the other core city within Snohomish County is Linwood. There are 13 larger cities, 51 smaller cities, and then the unincorporated urban growth areas. Um, just as a footnote to Vision 2040, planning for Vision 2050 is already underway with anticipated adoption in 2020. Vision 2040 was adopted in 2008, um, and the, the planning, as I said, has already started for Vision 2050. So that's the the second level down from the Growth Management Act. Going one step further down um, are the countywide planning policies. So Vision 2040 and the Growth Management Act say that counties and the communities within them must achieve the goals that we talked about in Vision 2040. One way that the counties do that in conjunction with the cities within them is through adopting countywide planning policies. So countywide pl planning policies serve as a framework for local comprehensive plans and development regulations. And the purpose of the countywide planning policies is to ensure consistency between county and city comprehensive plans. For example, the creation of urban growth areas to accommodate growth. That's an exercise that all of the cities within each county gets together and, and, and participated in. We all came up with urban growth boundaries that didn't overlap, didn't leave gap areas. Um, and were mutually acceptable to all of the communities as well as the county. One of the, uh, one of the things that, that trickles down from Vision 2040 to the counties through the countywide planning policies um, are state mandated growth targets. So the State Office of Financial Management develops population projections for the state for each county. 
and then each fully planning county, of which King and Snohomish are, are then mandated to determine, in consultation with the cities, where that growth should be directed to occur. Under Vision 2040, the bulk of the growth is expected to take place within the metropolitan cities, the larger five cities, plus the core cities. And that's important to us because of, as I said, because of the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center, we are a core city within Snohomish County. Once these growth projections, projections are adopted, then the county and the cities are to use them in their comprehensive planning process and make sure that their plans can accommodate the projected level of growth. During Dave's presentation, he'll, he'll talk to you a little bit about land capacity and targets and accommodating those targets. But essentially, as a core city, we have a certain amount of growth, projected growth, that we have to accommodate. We have to do that under our comprehensive plan designations. In Bothell, our zoning matches those plan designations exactly. So as Dave will talk about a little bit more, each um, several years, we undergo a process called buildable lands analysis, where we essentially look at every parcel, how it's designated, how it's zoned, and what the capacity on that parcel is according to that zoning. When we go through that exercise and add everything up, we then have an idea of how much population in terms of housing and how much employment we can accommodate and whether we meet the growth targets or not. When we did the major periodic plan update in 2015, we added some residential capacity to both the Canyon Park Regional Center and to the Country Village area because we were short on our population growth targets for Snohomish County because of the Regional Growth Center core city designation. So just a little bit more on buildable lands analysis. Um, the state's buildable lands program has designated the counties of Clark, King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish, and Thurston. Um, those are the Vision 2040 counties, uh, with the addition of a couple of others, as being counties that have to collect data about their development trends. Again, we calculate land capacity under existing comprehensive plan designations for a 20-year period to determine whether or not we're meeting those growth targets. And capacity is measured in terms of employment, or jobs, and housing, or population. Employment is a little harder to track than housing because employment numbers change daily. As employers hire people, lay people off, go out of business, new, employee, new businesses spring up, employment changes constantly. As with other county-led programs, such as the countywide planning policies, uh, we're somewhat unique in having to coordinate with two counties, King and Snohomish, when planning for growth. So we have two sets of countywide planning policies that we need to be consistent with in our comprehensive planning. We have two different buildable lands analyses that we need to undertake each year. The methodologies are slightly different for both. In King County, um, they leave it to us to do all of the analysis. Snohomish County does the bulk of the analysis for us with input from, from us and then quality check, checking from us. But the methodologies are slightly different. Um, it's one of those quirks of being a, a, a two-county city. We have one staff, but we have to almost act like two staffs at times. And again, the city must provide sufficient capacity to meet growth targets separately in both counties. We're not allowed to take our deficit from Snohomish County, for example, in 2015, and add it to King County, where we had a slight surplus. We have to accommodate our growth targets in the county in which the county is planning. Uh, currently, we have a small surplus capacity in both King and Snohomish County portions of the city after adopting the, the 2015 plan update. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions on that section uh, or happy to leave them until uh, you're ready till later. Um, your choice. I, I have a feeling most of your questions are probably going to come as we get down into the, into the weeds. Um, so to speak, when we get down towards development review process and, and that sort of thing, but. Uh, I did have one question. So in 2015, we had a deficit? We did have a small deficit in the Snohomish County portion of the city, yes. Only Snohomish County, Yes, right? that's correct. Okay, and then now, um, I think we're gonna get into it later, so later slides, we'll have, we have a surplus? Yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, thanks. So if there are any other questions? With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Boyd, and Dave's gonna talk about the Imagine Bothell Comprehensive Plan and related efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start off the, the added note there, and, and there are a few little changes from the presentation that was sent to you last uh, last uh, evening um, that 
we wanted to emphasize that the comprehensive plan is uh, about more than just land use, uh, very much more. Uh, it's an aspirational document, it's visionary, it's uh, supportive of the people here in Bothell, it's inclusive of all of the people in Bothell, uh, it gets technical uh, in, a, in a kind of general policy level way, and it's influence. It's influential. Its presence is felt throughout the city and not just uh, within our department, but within all uh, departments within the, the city. The, it constitutes a detailed vision uh, and uh, it uh, provides a direction for city decisions uh, affecting the form and the function of the city. It uh, was first established in 1996 uh, following the adoption of the Growth Management Act, uh, but it has been updated now uh, three times since then and uh, is generally updated every eight years. Uh, uh, so the next update is due in 2023. Sometimes there's some, some adjustment to those, those deadlines. Uh, but that means we're gonna start, have to start thinking about that next update in just uh, a couple, couple more years to start planning for that. Uh, Gary mentioned the, the population targets. This table shows uh, the current population and, and target uh, uh, populations as well as uh, population capacity. That's the zoned capacity uh, for both King and Snohomish County in the upper table as well as uh, employment capacity in the lower table. Uh, and as you can see, there is a, uh, we, you could call it a surplus, but it would be very difficult to do zoning at to such a fine level that you would just be hitting that target right on. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's it's normal that there be a, a little bit more capacity than than the uh, actual target. The Bothell planning area is shown in this uh, map. Uh, the it includes our current city limits plus a fairly large area in Snohomish County that wraps around the the. Uh, east, west, and north uh, side uh, of the north part of the county. Uh, in King County, uh, we completed all of the potential annexations in, in 2014, so those boundaries uh, are now fixed. Uh, the current city limits uh, includes a land area of uh, about 8,800 acres or 13.7 square miles. Just a little bit of over half of that area is in King County. Uh, the population is is uh, a little bit more skewed towards King County. It's about a 60-40 uh, split uh, in population, and currently we're uh, at an estimated uh, 44,370 population. Uh, looking a little closer at Snohomish County, uh, the potential annexation area there is about 3,600 acres with a population of over 22,000. So that with that area, uh, when that does come into the city, uh, we'll have a, a land area of uh, almost 20, little under 20 square miles and a population capacity or target of uh, about 64,000. And so that's the population that, uh, for example, this city hall was, was designed to serve uh, the staff that we would need to serve that population. So what's in the, the uh, Imagine Bothell Comprehensive Plan. First of all, there are 13 planning area-wide elements uh, with goals, policy, and, and actions for each element. Uh, and the elements include land use, housing, transportation, uh, and those, and natural environment. Those are all uh, state mandated elements. Uh, there are other elements that uh, the city uh, has chosen to include uh, that aren't uh, state mandated, like uh, historic preservation, uh, shoreline management is a state man mandated element and, and, and others. Uh, so the transportation as an ex element as, exam as uh, an example provides uh, uh, policy guidance uh, citywide for transportations including transit, pedestrian, bicycles, and, and vehicles. The uh, land use element, uh, uh, which is one that we're working with on a daily basis, uh, contains this uh, figure LU3, which depicts land use designations across the entire planning area. Uh, and uh, it's quite complex, so it uh, doesn't show up too well on, at this scale. Uh, the comprehensive plan also includes uh, 17 sub-area plans, including sub-areas within our potential annexation area. Uh, and it's within those sub-areas that the more detailed uh, 
uh, plan designations and zoning classifications are, are applied. So, for example, in Maywood Beckstrom here, you can see the the actual uh, uh, zoning uh, classifications uh, designations uh, that are the same as our uh, zoning classifications. They also contain specific policies to that sub area. Uh, uh, some sub areas have have more uh, of their own uh, uh, specific uh, uh, policies, uh, goals, and actions than others. Uh, and uh, Canyon Park uh, is a sub area, and the Canyon Park Regional Growth Area is within that sub area. The uh, RGC is outlined in yellow here. We have started a visioning effort uh, with the stakeholders in Canyon Park, and we will be continuing that uh, planning effort uh, through uh, 2018 and, and uh, into 2019. Uh, this is a, a large effort, uh, uh, similar in, in scale and effort to uh, the downtown plan that we did in uh, uh, 2006 through 2009. Uh, the comprehensive plan also informs a number of other uh, citywide plans and uh, programs. Uh, the cap capital facilities plan draws on both the utilities and transportation elements of the comp plan. Uh, uh, and this is a, the cover of the uh, capital facilities plan here. Uh, the housing strategy that will be coming to you uh, uh, in this first quarter will uh, builds upon the housing and human services element uh, and provides additional direction uh, to staff on how, how, to, how to achieve those goals, policies, and, and actions. Uh, other plans and programs build upon and uh, implement other elements of the comprehensive plan goals, uh, policies, and actions, including uh, perhaps the one that we work with uh, most extensively, the Bothell Municipal Code. Uh, this is, there is a direct correlation between the comprehensive plan uh, goals and policies and the implementation, Im implementing code, which you f we find in the Bothell Municipal Code. There are, uh, uh, Development regulations exist within uh, titles 11 through 22, which are shown here. The color, color coding just indicates which uh, of your of the council's uh, uh, various boards and commissions uh, deal with those particular uh, uh, parts of the uh, municipal code. Uh, and of course, the city council can, if we are bringing um, amendments, can. Uh, hear those directly themselves, but the, the, the normal process is, is to refer those to uh, the appropriate uh, board or commission. And in this, the, the role of staff, uh, uh, I'm not going to read through all of this, but we're here to uh, serve the council, to uh, help implement the council's goals and policies, uh, to provide our uh, professional recommendations, and uh, and uh, help move this whole process forward. And with that, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Jeff to get into the uh, specifics of the planning process and, and development review process. Uh, pending any questions, yes. Yeah, can we ask, I have a couple of quick, quick questions. So the sub area planning, you said that they, they have their own customized basically policies for their sub areas. Some of them have, have detailed policies specific just to that their uh, specific sub area. Yeah. So was the there was the public involved in deciding kind of which policies would apply to their specific sub areas? Did we? I imagine we did. I just wanted the public to know kind of what we did in the past and did we go out or whatever invite them in and have them help us create what their sub area should be? Yeah. When when we uh, go through the the update, we do. Uh, do outreach and uh, did uh, notify all the uh, addresses in each sub area. Notified them when when su their sub area is, is uh, coming up for discussion. Um, I should point out that the the citywide elements uh, uh, those apply apply citywide, uh, and then sub area uh, plans provide additional uh, uh, goals and policies uh, on top of those citywide elements. Um. I guess that's for another question. Is there any times where there's been conflict between a citywide element and a, a sub area plan chapter? Not that I can think of, and, and part of the process that we go through is to make sure that those 
those conflicts don't exist. Uh, and if we discover conflicts, we, we will try to, to uh, remedy those, fix those. So then my, my last question, I was, I was looking at the different titles of the, the municipal code that are applied or land use related, and it was interesting because it skipped over title 16. What Do we know, is there a reason for that? Sorry. This might be a Jeopardy yeah, question. You, in the municipal code, title 16 is simply reserved for future use. It's empty. Okay. It's an empty box. Cool. Those are my questions. You showed the uh, map showing Snohomish County and the annexation area that we're going to annex at one point in time. Do we have any timeline on that? And do we have a methodology to successfully annex that area? Uh, I don't believe there is any uh, timeline at this point. Uh, the, as you know, there were, we tried the election method twice uh, back in 2010 and 11, and um, that narrowly failed. Uh, there are other methods. There, there's a, a, a petition method uh, that would be very difficult to do for the whole area at once, but uh, I know that there has been talk of uh, at least one area where, where the election would have passed in that particular area where, where there is some interest in, in doing moving forward with the petition method, but until they, they bring that petition to us and to city council, uh, that process doesn't start. Um, there also, since that those uh, elections, there is a new interlocal method that's available that we used for the King County annexations, whether that uh, would work uh, with Snohomish County, uh, uh, we haven't really explored, but the assumption is that it it wouldn't because it would include all of the jurisdictions, including the fire districts, to be supportive. And if I may. Thank you. Tonight is also an opportunity um, for you to ask those kinds of questions and bring them to your goal setting. Because if there are things, if you are interested in, in reapproaching an annexation, the Snohomish County annexation, that would be a discussion for your goal setting and determine if that's something you want staff to work on in the coming year. And so out of this, as we're going through this material and you're seeing things that you want to change or you want to talk about or, or you really want to have this, this new council discuss, um, either let me know during this discussion or bring it to the goal setting on the 19th. And then it can be discussed there and then also discussed as part of the 2018 docket for work for CD. So that's one of the hopes out of tonight is that we we inform you and help you understand this process so you can identify things that you have an interest as a majority to potentially change or have influence on. Um, getting back to the, the annexation piece, so um, is the growth um, population, is that fact is that part of the factorization of the annexation are we assuming that I think it's 3,000 or something like that um, population growth is that part of the annexation or uh, well w when we annex we would we would redo our our uh, growth targets and our, our uh, and our capacity uh, analysis to include that area so so I guess short answer is no we're not counting on annexation to meet any of those growth targets uh, I, I did point out what, what the estimated target would be with the annexation uh, here, uh, but once that happens, you know, and especially if it happens piecemeal, if we do uh, one piece at a time, then we'd be adjusting our Snohomish County growth target based on our, our uh, uh, current, the area within our current city limits or our city limits at that time. So I believe you had a slide up there that had some growth targets. Yeah. So this is based on our current uh, uh, boundaries. 2035 versus 2040? Well, our current, the, the 2015 boundaries, what, what the projection would be for 2035. Yeah. Okay, so these, the population targets in this formula are not considering the annexation. That's correct, yeah. If it helps to think of it this way, at the current time, in the Snohomish County potential annexation area that you showed around the top of the city, at the current time, Snohomish County manages the growth targets for that area. 
so they do the planning to accommodate that growth. In the future, if that area were to annex into the city, then we would manage the growth target and how we manage that growth for the whole thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the 64,000 number that... That includes that growth area plus the city total. That's okay. both combined. Okay, so we are combining them. Okay. And you, you hit on a point that, that is interesting to note. Our buildable lands growth targets are 2035, uh, but Vision 2040 goes out five years beyond that. So, so everything is not perfectly lined up in terms of regional planning. Okay. And then, um, is, so I'm assuming that both King and Snohomish County, the population growth is population and not housing units. Is there a way to see what population growth means in housing units? There is. Uh, there are multipliers that we use. Uh, we use a different multiplier for single family housing and for multifamily housing. Uh, but yeah, there is a way to, to uh, um, make those, those, uh, those calculations. Yeah. Okay, so at some point we'd be able to see how many housing units we have now. Because um, it says surplus, but I, that's population surplus. That's not housing surplus, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ready to move on? Oh, there we go. All right. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk to you guys tonight. Um, as Gary said, you don't necessarily see a lot of me in, in front of you because uh, my area of work and expertise is is really in the in the application section of all of the things that you've heard tonight. Um, uh, it, Gary described it as an iterative, if you can imagine it that way, the GMA at the top, the comprehensive planning section here, and then you get into development review, specific development review, and permitting. And that's, you can think of it as a place where the rubber really meets the road. That's where all of that work that gets into that gets, gets um, uh, applied on the ground in dealing with permits and requests for development approvals and those kind of things. Uh, so, so imagine that that, that, is, that is the specific application of regulations that are built and designed to implement all of those wishes that came down from, from the, the upper tiers of what Gary talked about. Uh, land use, until we talk about land use entitlement and development permits. They're, they're similar, but they're different in many ways. We have quasi-judicial and administrative actions, really, in development review. Quasi-judicial are decisions that require a public hearing and a decision by a hearing examiner. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that we employ a hearing examiner in the city of Bothell to make our quasi-judicial decisions. These are legally binding decisions. Uh, they deal with things like subdivisions, final subdivisions, conditional use permits, variances, shoreline, certain shoreline permits, uh, and that sort of things. Appeals from administrative decisions go to the hearing examiner. Um, then, then the tier below that is administrative approvals, and those are things that we do in-house, and the ultimate decision on those is by the director of either community development or public works. That's things like short plats. Um, you can see the list there, boundary line adjustments, uh, actual building permits, grading permits, utility permits. There's a whole slug of things that, uh, that we make decisions on administratively. Now, when you get to a point in, in administrative decision making, the variability and in, in, in the, in the delta between what you can and cannot do is, is pretty tightly wound at that point. There's, there's only so many certain things you can do, and, and they tend to be what we call non-discretionary permits. That is, uh, uh, someone comes in, they present a, a proposal to us, they demonstrate clearly that they meet the code, be it a building code, for example. They meet the building code. If they do that, we're obligated to give them a permit to conduct that activity. Um, I think it's important to, to correlate some of this. Dave and Gary both showed you a slide that that showed the zoning. It showed the well. It showed the, the comprehensive planning designations for the city. Out of that come zoning designations for the city. I think it's important to keep in mind out there that on that map there is no place that says do nothing. Right. Every square inch of the city of Bothell is identified as a place where something can be done. Now, whether that something gets done or not is up to the 
the marketplace out there is up to private property owners and, and their wishes for when they want to maybe develop their property. How they do it is more of what we get involved in in the exchange that we get involved with, uh, with developers and with property owners and homeowners and other things like that. Um, so so I, wanted, I want you to think about the, the development review process a bit as an assembly line, if you can imagine that in your mind. Uh, we start with things, pre-applications. Uh, we try to get engaged with people who are considering changing, maybe building something on their property, selling their property to a developer, a developer who's interested in maybe a subdivision or some other kind of building on their property. We get, we get with them early on and we do what's called a pre-application, a conceptual look at a project idea that's informal uh, but non-binding. And then those can sometimes come to fruition, come back to us as permits. Sometimes they go away and we never see them again. Uh, the, the land use entitlement application review, this is really the meaty part of what we do. This is probably the part that you hear about with constituents directly. Uh, this is where, this is where uh, major projects, I'll call them subdivisions, conditional use permits, large buildings, those kind of things go through this process um, and, and this is the most labor intensive side of the, of the, of the activity in, in development review. Uh, this is where public hearings get held in front of the hearing examiner. This is where appeals come from, generally, that kind of thing. Uh, after the land use entitlement process, a developer or applicant or builder goes away and they develop uh, engineering review and, and detailed construction plans. We call it hard engineering, where they really put fine tune to what they're going to build. They bring those plans in, they get reviewed administratively in-house, and if they uh, if they are consistent with the entitlement that the, that that project received, they get approved and then they go out and begin to build things. And we have inspectors and all kinds of things that go on during that process. Uh, beyond that, you get into specific building reviews. That's, that's for example, in a subdivision, that's when the houses would come in. And then each individual house goes through a building permit review. Uh, again, presentation of plans and a review of those plans and, and, and then approval of those plans. Uh, again, more oversight of their physical construction, building permit. We have building inspectors who go out and inspect the actual buildings that get built. And that can be, again, anything from a house to a multifamily project to a commercial building to a, a retail store, that kind of thing. Uh, we finally get into final inspections after all of that stuff is done. And in final inspections, uh, we try to affirm, we, we affirm that all elements of this process up to this point have been complied with. And when, when that's been confirmed, uh, we may release performance bonds, we may take on maintenance bonds that are required for landscaping and things like that that need to grow and thrive for a period of a few years, and ultimately they get, they get, uh, they get, um, they get released and the project just lives its life on the ground out there. Uh, sometimes there's final entitlements, we call that. That would be, so, for example, a final plat, a final subdivision. Uh, uh, that goes back to the hearing examiner in a closed record review. Uh, without getting too far in the weeds on that, it's just a final analysis before, uh, before recording of those, of those new lots in a subdivision. That's a period of time too when final payment of fees and charges occurs. Uh, for example, the big one in that these days is school impact fees. That's when those get paid, uh, at least half of them get paid. Half get paid at final plat, the other half get paid with each building permit when they come in. It's a way of spreading that, that obligation across uh, the folks that really have created that necessity. So, um, so then, part, part of this whole process and something you may have heard about before is called SEPA, state, the State Environmental Policy Act. Uh, SEPA is a, a process that is integral to our development review process. It's mandated by the state. It is, a, it is an environmental analysis that the city must perform on certain qualifying projects. You have to be a certain size, 4,000 square feet of commercial space, four dwelling units or more, 500 cubic yards of grading material, that sort of stuff, triggers what's called a SEPA review. SEPA uh, um, uh, seeks to mitigate the, the un, unforeseen, as it were, uh, impacts of, of development. Uh, um, 
when the city goes through that process and determines what that level of impact might be and whether or not it needs specific mitigation, we issue what's called a threshold determination. SEPA is not a permit. This is an important distinction. It is an assessment. It's a determination of likely environmental impacts and any mitigation needed to, to fix them or to reduce them in severity. It gets kind of wonky and I don't want to get too, too deep in it with you. I, I'd be happy to answer questions as we, get, as we get farther down this. I think it's important under SEPA. This is the key to the whole thing. All development, if you think of property out there, all development results in some form of impact. If you take a, a new piece of property that nothing's there and suddenly you want to build a house, you want to build a building on it, there's going to be an impact to doing that. Our existing codes, we have a whole giant book full of codes. Those existing codes serve to mitigate the impacts of that. We limit the height of buildings. We limit their bulk, their size, their scale. We limit uh, setbacks. We have them set back from the street or we don't or whatever we do. All those kind of things essentially are designed to mitigate the impacts of that change on the land. Sometimes though, you can't write a, you can't write a code book that's going to address every possible circumstance that you might run into out there in the real world. And so sometimes you have a project that comes along in a, in a land form that it's trying to fit itself to, that kind of thing, where something that, that the codes could not have anticipated uh, happens. And SEPA is a tool that we have in our toolkit that allows us to address those, those impacts of an unforeseen nature if needed. That's where we can apply specific mitigation to reduce the severity of, an, of, of something the result of a project out there. And that's when we utilize it primarily. Now, I'll point out to the council that um, Bothell, Bothell's codes are really well developed and really well designed, and we use them extensively. They really, they take care of 98% of the, the, what's perceived as negative impacts of development. Um, we don't, we, we more rarely these days impose mitigation through SEPA because it's, it's really not necessary to get it to a level of moderate impact and that's what that's the goal of all of these laws. So it's important to keep that in mind that, that our codes, as detailed as they are, do an extremely good job of, of mitigating impacts. Uh, part of what we do is also involving public input and appeals. Uh, public input, we, we welcome and, uh, and the laws require us to ask people what they think and to have them get involved and hear and see the projects that are coming down, uh, that are developed, um, that, are, that are submitted for development review. We, uh, we have public notice, we have many forms of public notice that we, we put out for development projects. We have notices of application. A notice of application is really us telling the neighborhood, hey you guys, this came in, it's in for review. If you'd like to know more about it, contact our staff and, and they'll, they'll show you the plans and answer any questions you have about it, that sort of thing. That happens at the very front end of a project. As soon as it's, as soon as it's uh, submitted to us for review, uh, we, we let people know. That's, I don't know if you're familiar, that's the 500 foot diameter around the property. We mail to all those people. We put ads in the newspaper. We put up notices on our website. Uh, that's when the sign goes up on the property, the four by four uh, plywood sign that you, you see a lot of them around town because we're very busy these days. You see those, that's when all of that, that's, that's what that initial notice is for. After that, when we get into should, should a project qualify for a SEPA determination, that's also noticed. It's mailed out. It's we call post, publish, and mail. So it's posted, it's published, and mailed. And then uh, if, if there's a public hearing for a particular kind of project, for qualifying projects, public hearing is scheduled on a particular date, time, and location. That's also sent out in the same fashion, post, publish, and mail. Uh, um, then in the end of the whole thing, there's, there's what's called a notice of decision. When all of those processes have come to their conclusion and, and a decision has been made, that, that is issued out. Um, that's issued out in a more limited fashion because it, it addresses, it goes out to people who have expressed interest in knowing the answer to what's been going on. It's not a broadcast uh, notice. And that's about it in a nutshell. <laughs> It's a lot of stuff in a very short period of time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Oh, oh yeah, you were gonna. <laughs> I got a few questions. Okay. Um, 
So um, going back to the very beginning of your pre fabulous presentation, gentlemen, by the way, appreciate everything. Um, going back to the beginning, do all cities have to adhere to the GMA? Well, no. So if you recall, um, I talked about something called fully planning communities. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a map on here that looks like it's just there for decoration, but actually, um, the different colors on here show um, different levels of planning under GMA. So the green ones show the 18 counties that are required to plan fully. So that's the whole process that we talked about with growth targets and all that stuff. The, um, the blue counties, the, the light blue counties here, are counties that opted in to plan fully. So they felt that it was in their best interest to, to plan as fully as the fully planning counties and come up with comprehensive plans and so forth. Uh, the ones in the gray are counties that are, are not required to. They have different, they still plan under GMA, they just have different levels of planning that they have to do. It tends to be uh, more focused on protecting resource lands and mineral lands and so forth. So it, based on your map here, both King and Snohomish County, all cities within King and Snohomish County have to adhere to the GMA. Yes, absolutely. And in, in fact, the entire Puget Sound region is all fully planning communities. Okay. Um, how are we, you had, uh, I believe sl slide six and seven, um, in our packet anyway, showed um, 14 goals. How are we doing with those 14 goals in, in, gen in general? Are we Well, the easiest, the easiest way to answer that is, is that there is no easy, easy answer to that. Um, and, that, and I'm not trying, trying to be trite, um, but as I mentioned, the GMA doesn't prioritize any of these goals. However, our comprehensive plan has been certified by the state as being GMA compliant. So I guess that's a way of saying that the state is satisfied that our comprehensive plan balances and prioritizes these goals according to our community's stated desires and needs. Okay, so that leads me kind of into the the next question, which would be, I think Jeff, you alluded to, everything is developable. Everything is available to be developed. Yeah, right. Yes, everything is available to be considered for development. They're all obviously suitable to a varying degree. Some, some much more than others, some not at all. Um, but very few are, are not at all, to be honest with you. There's, because that gets into a whole legal realm where there's takings of property and all those sort of things. So, so yes, is that? So how do we, as we go through this process, look to the future? Because it sounds like you guys have a lot of analytics, you've done a lot of research, a lot of work on looking at what can be developed, how it can be developed, rezoning, what rezoning should look like. How do we, how do we get that information looking forward into the future, what we're going to look like, so that we as a council don't make decisions to rezone something that would basically put us into a position where we're not adhering to these 14 goals mm -hmm. or not doing a better job balancing these 14 goals it is a it is a it is a complex and comprehensive process that's why it's called a comprehensive plan right uh, it's a lot of input in a lot of different areas um, well, Gary's probably going to be able to answer this a little better than I can but but it is a it is a long-term process it's a very detailed process as you can tell um, uh, you end up you end up creating a document or set of documents that really expresses what the community has told you they want the place to look like ultimately, what their preferred outcome is. It doesn't mean on any specific piece of property that you know exactly what's going to happen or what it's going to look like. You've, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a realm of things that could possibly occur there. Um, does, that, does that help? It, it, it does, and I guess where I'm going with this is, to me, my fear is that we we look out into the future and say, this is what we want our city to look like. But then when we go and we have people that bring us spot zones here and there and we make them part of a different plan, how do we make sure that we're balancing, you know, open space, the environmental impacts, things like that? Um, you know, I, I, look at, I look at holistically what you guys are presenting, I think it's fabulous. But as a council member, I wanna make, I wanna be assured that I'm looking at the whole picture. Um, because we do hear a lot from our community that we're, we're under growth pressure right now. There's a lot of people in the community think that we're growing way too fast, but maybe we aren't. Um, yeah. How do we message this to make sure that the community knows 
what we're going to look like in the future, where we're trying to go, and that we are doing it based on what the community wants. So those are fantastic comments because we hear that all the time too. It's important to note that the comprehensive plan, as we've already said, sets forth the city's vision. This is what we want Boston to look like, and we're doing that for the next 20 years. We are going through an unprecedented period of growth right now. Um, we have never seen permits coming in at the pace they're coming in. But it's important to note that that development is occurring within the comprehensive plan designations. It may just be occurring right now at a faster rate than we anticipated. And that's why we have a periodic comprehensive plan review. So every eight years we go back and we look at the comprehensive plan and we essentially bring you the buildable lands analyses, the, where we're at with the growth targets, and all these other measures that we're required to, to look at. And that's a chance to take a breath and say, where are we at in terms of growth targets? Where, how much land have we used up? How much have we got left? Do we need to rezone some areas because they, this type of development just hasn't worked for us? And that's what we do in those eight-year periodic reviews for the comprehensive plan. As I said, the last one was just, um, just over two years ago. Um, it can be very difficult to, to see that big comprehensive planning picture and try to equate it with what's happening on the ground today. And it, it's certainly not an easy thing to explain to, to your constituents or our customers. It, it's, it's very difficult to visualize that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I think but we're the doing important thing to note is that the, even the growth that is occurring now at a rapid rate is, a, is growing according to the plan designations. For example, if a specific piece of land is zoned R9600, that's a single family residential zone. It means there has to be a minimum lot size of 9,600 square feet. So the subdivision that is going in next to you within that zone is being developed to that standard. That growth was accounted for in the comprehensive plan and the buildable lands process, and it, it's, it's now happening. What we're seeing now, again, is we're seeing a lot of it happen all at once. But it's already been planned for. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so I guess I would close with uh, uh, one other thing is, are, are we working closely with the school district um, so that the school district understands what our growth targets are so that they can accommodate the growth that we're going to go through? Is that yes, something that's that we correct. do on, as a city, we do that on a regular basis? Uh, we do have periodic meetings with the school district, and they get the same data from PSRC and OFM that the city does. Okay. Um, and then I guess for me, just a couple of things. It'd be, I think it would be good to have uh, what our current population actually is, um, how many housing units we currently have, um, and what um, our population range housing, you know, what that growth population would look like in the future. Um, I think it'd be important just to get that information to us, maybe out to the public, because there is a, a perception out there that we're, we're the fastest growing city in the region. Um, and I think I've heard that it's actually north, just north of us. Um, we are growing fast, yes, but um, I want to make sure that the community fully understands that we want to be balanced and we want to look at this. But um, I think it would be important for us to, to have that information. A lot of that information is on the, on the web now. And uh, before the meeting, I had uh, asked Laura to provide you with a, a list of resources so that if you want to drill deeper into any of these items that we talked about, Vision 2040, Snohomish County Tomorrow, all of those things, uh, the buildable lands analyses. I've given you web links to all of the documents for everything we've talked about tonight. Um, so you can go online, you can look at the buildable lands analyses, you can read the conclusions of those, um, and then feel free to follow up with questions. You know, we're happy to, to, to help you work through that. That's all um, available for the public as well. Correct? Yes, that okay. absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I have a bunch of questions. Um, so could you go back to the map that showed the uh, core cities and the metropolitan areas and the... There we go. So kind of to this end, to, to, to feed off of what Councilmember Member McNeil brought up, the um, where is the urban growth boundary? So the urban growth boundary is essentially the white area that you see on the map there. So that's a compilation of all of the urban growth areas for all of the counties and cities and communities within uh, this Vision 24 region. So that, that white boundary you see, that's the urban growth boundary. Everything in white is designated as urban growth. And so those little islands are actually cities, right? Uh, like those are Duval. smaller cities, and they're also um, unincorporated urban areas that the counties plan for. So um, 
one of the things that that I've talked about quite a few times, I don't know if I've talked about it up here, but um, I grew up in Bothell and there was, you know, very few people here at the time. A lot of people had acreage. Um, we had horses and cows and, and you know, wild stuff, whatever. Everybody, there was a lot more woods. There was a whole lot less people. And for people to kind of understand this, I think is really important that there's a regional growth boundary. So everything in the green, basically in this map here, they're not expecting to see a whole lot more growth than there is now. Even in the unincorporated King County areas, it's actually denser than it probably would be if it was developed today because the, the Growth Management Act wasn't there when it was built. And so although I, I don't want to tell people we'll just move out, but quite frankly, if you do want to live in a place that is rural, that is not, uh, and for the long haul, um, you might want to start thinking about living in those areas that are green. Because by design, we are going to accommodate growth within these white areas, um, and that's because transportation becomes a whole lot more expensive if you got to run lines, bus lines, large freeways, that type of thing, all over the place, sewers, water, I mean, go, go down the line. So it's not only economically smart to try to, to essentially pack people in, but it's better for the environment. Uh, you have a lot more, um, you're going to have a lot more impact within the urban growth boundary than you will out in the outskirts. But I think that the important part to understand is that if we don't do that, it'll be a lot like Los Angeles here, where you'll just have just cities upon cities just going to, to the, basically to the foothills of the Cascades. Um, I, I, I trust this plan. I, I think this plan's a, a good thing. I've I've struggled with it in the past because it was frustrating. Just like, well, I want to have a healthy environment where I live too, and I think that's the balance in which that we're still struggling as a region to try to get to. Is like, well, how much is enough to inside the urban growth boundary so that you know it, it's healthy enough and and people f can connect with nature where they live. They can they can have fresh air and the streams are healthy and all that stuff, and. Um, and I think we can get there. I think that we've got work to do. This has only been around since the 80s, and um, you know we've we've made some pretty big pretty big steps towards that. But I I just wanted to point that out to people that because I know we hear it a lot like oh you guys are destroying the city you're letting all the trees get logged uh, you're just packing houses in, and my answer to them is yeah that's intentional. I mean that's that's what we have to do. We we don't we don't get to opt out of this option. It's a state law. Um, if the city did decide to say, you know, we're done with this, we're not going to let any more uh, development or growth happen here, uh, you'll, we would lose all state funding. Uh, we would, I don't know what other sanctions they would do, but it's pretty substantial. We get quite a bit of money from the state, and that would just be gone if, if we didn't cooperate. So um, there's moratoriums that can be done. Those are very time limited, and they're very for very specific reasons. You have to have a work plan to get yourself out of a moratorium if you want to stop growth. So I just kind of wanted to just add those couple things on because we I hear about these things all the time when we go meet regionally. Um, so a couple other things comparing us to other places. Um, I've noticed that, okay, so our comprehensive plan, is it codified? Is it like actual municipal code or is it just, it's adopted by the council? No, the, the comprehensive plan is your legislative document, is your policy document. So that's that's where you have, with any legislative process, you have a lot more leeway and a lot more scope to to craft that so that's where you express your your goals and policies for the city your vision for the city through that legislative process it's the titles in the Bothell municipal code that then take that and codify that into specific regulations and especially for new people here so what's what's the difference between being codified and being a policy document um, well Paul can weigh in if he wants to it's partly a legal distinction but So I think what you're getting at is um, why we sometimes have to, we can just do code amendments on a regular basis, but then we can only amend the comprehensive plan once a year. And that's under the growth, that's from the Growth Management Act, is that it needs to be a calculated thought decision. And so when you amend the comprehensive plan and the policies, uh, that's something you're going to carefully consider every single year. Sometimes it coincides with changes in zoning, um, changes with other parts of the code. Uh, but that's why they're separate, is we have a, a long-range policy of what we want to do and how we want to see our city, and then we can amend the code, because um, not everything deals with zoning, not everything deals with the planning portions, it deals with other parts of it. So you can amend the code on a more regular basis, and then just amend the comprehensive plan once a year. 
So we could amend the zoning code more than once a year? Yes, yeah, so, so Mayor, I think I know where you're going with this. Okay. And the, the reason that we, we only revisit the comprehensive plan on, a, on an overall basis once every eight years is because it is the guiding document. So we have to meet those big GMA goals of keeping growth in urban areas, for example. However, when you get down to the zoning level, things like tree retention is a perfect example. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot recently that, that the tree retention uh, codes that we have now aren't working the way we, we would like them to work. So that's where you are able to, through the docketing process each year, say we need to revisit, we think we need to revisit the tree retention regulations. Um, that's the very specific um, application on a development process level of some of the, the visions and goals within the comprehensive plan, which say we want to be a green city. We want to keep the feathered edge of the skyline of the trees against the sky. So yes, you, you can um, revisit development regulations more frequently. And that's what the docketing process is for each year. So, um, so now I'm going to get into the public hearings too. So this might be a Paul question as well, or city attorney question as well. Is that you have to hold public hearings for I think land use municipal codes. Other other things you ne don't necessarily need to hold a public hearing. Is that correct? Correct. And again, it's the difference between Jeff talked about entitlements versus um, permits. So a land use entitlement is typically, for example, subdividing a large piece of land into smaller lots. That's an entitlement process. Uh, a permit, for example, just getting a building permit for a single family home, that's not an entitlement process. That's a, that's a prescriptive permit. If you meet the building code, you get to build a house. So the public hearings tend to be held for entitle, the entitlement type um, uh, processes rather than the, the permit types. And the, the other thing regarding public hearings is that they're governed by statute. The statute will dictate whether or not a public hearing needs to Correct. occur. So is it safe to say anything in Title 11 through 22 would require a public hearing if we wanted to modify it? Um, having not reviewed Titles 11 through 22 before this meeting, I'm not really prepared to say yes or no. Okay. But I'm happy to provide that information at a future date. Okay. I will say, though, that, that not everything in Titles 11 through 22 uh, could require a, a hearing. Okay. For example, you wouldn't want to he hold a hearing examiner hearing for a single family home building permit or for an electrical permit or for a deck permit. And that's a lot of what's in Title 11 through 22. Okay. Um, so vesting. So the so Jeff brought up the uh, there's a building there's a, let's see, land use entitlement. Is that when people are vested to standards? Yes, generally, that's correct. Okay. And there are certain actions that, that vest you to a project, such as a grading permit, a, a building permit, or a subdivision application. Those three, in particular, um, uh, court decisions have, have clearly stated that those, submitting for those three permits vest you to the codes um, and development regulations in effect at the time you submit a complete application. So let's say if I got a subdivision application, I turned everything in, and then the subsequent building permits, are those still vested to those standards when I got the subdivision? Well, the underlying subdivision would be. The building permits aren't really affected by the same subdivision regulations. Okay. Vesting really goes to the, the entitlements, the larger, the subdivision, um, that sort of thing, the grading. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, because I, I know tree retention is coming up, so the the how lot yield is calculated on you know your your square footage of land. I think Bothell is unique in how we calculate it, and so I was hoping that we could you could maybe explain. And I should have asked you this beforehand. If you could explain how we do it, um, and then how others, if you know how other cities might do it, because what I understand is that you, the way we set it up, you get less yield per acre here than you would in other cities. I'm going to let Jeff respond to that. Um. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Yeah, we're not all that different from other cities uh, in that in that you, you have gross land area, and then we extract certain things before you can start dividing by the minimum lot size. For example, in Bothell right now, um, the you you extract critical areas and their buffers and any land dedicated to the city. 
Now we changed that just a couple years ago, actually, where we used to extract the, the area required for stormwater management facilities, for example, detention ponds, vaults, that sort of thing. We used to extract that before you did the math. The council changed the code to put that back in so that now the only thing you take away, take, say if you have one acre of ground, and, and in that acre of ground you have a quarter acre of wetland and a quarter acre of wetland buffer, and, and let's say no, no dedication for public streets or anything like that, you would, you would divide the remaining half acre by 9,600 and come up with a unit yield for that property. So that's the only things we extract now in terms of density calculations. It used to be more onerous, if that's the right word I could use, right? It used to, it used to take away a lot more things. So, so our, our yield out of a piece of property used to be uh, uh, lower than it is now. We, it's, it's a little bit higher than it, than it has been before. That's not all that different from other cities. Some pick different things that they want to extract. Different cities pick different things. Uh, I think Snohomish County, I think the counties in general, they, they allow you to count toward your unit yield, for example, critical area buffers. They let you keep that in the total square footage. Now, whether or not geometrically you'll be able to fit those units onto the, the form of the land once it's all done, you don't know yet until you lay it out, until you lay the site plan out. But at least you, ha you know what your, what your density potential is that way. So that's just a different way of doing it. Um, in Bothell, again, it's, it's critical areas, buffers, and uh, land dedicated to the city for various reasons. So in, in some cities, do they just say whatever the gross land is, you divide it by your zoning, and that's how many houses you get, and then there's, it's really dictated, so not everybody's going to get 9,600 right. square feet, you get smaller areas, because they'll try to fit them in, but there's, things come into play like lot circles, like Correct. you can't have lot circles overlapping, that type of thing. Correct. I, I don't know of any specifically that, that don't have any extractions at all, okay. but, but that is indeed possible, what you described is possible. And then you're right. It's a geometric exercise after that, right? It's geometry, it's landform. It's not all pieces of property are shaped in nice, nice. I wish they were all nice squares or rectangles. It would make a lot of this a lot easier, but they're not. And so then you start into the site planning process and that ultimately determines the actual yield of a piece of property when you start putting it on the ground. And then I've noticed, um, unfortunately, I had to search around different municipalities' codes, and I've noticed that sometimes cities keep their zoning code, and they call zoning code a very a broad term in some places. Uh, they, keep, they, they have it referenced in their municipal code, but they store it somewhere else. But where we have everything, you go to Code Publisher, and all of our information is up here. Mm -hmm. um, is there any benefits, or I, I can think of one thing that's not good, is that if somebody searches, here for, you know, there's a little search thing in the upper right hand corner and no offense to millennials, but if they search there and you have your zoning code and a link that is on the city's website, they're not going to find anything um, if they're looking for zoning code information. Um, is there any, is there any benefit to, to trying to take it out, take it out of this format and pulling it into our own custom zoning code format? Well, I think the cities that do it differently do it differently because they don't use code publishing. Um, and. Code publishing actually provides a, a great service to us because it means we, that we don't need to update and maintain our code ourselves. Uh, they're good at doing it, they're used to doing it, they provide all the links between all the different code sections, they make the searches work. Um, sometimes I've seen where other cities do it differently and they maintain their own code. Um, it is difficult to, to search within the different sections and have, um, for example, the same term show up in different, in different chapters. So I, I think the way we do it, works well but we like it okay. yeah i think so just checking um i think that is all the questions i have for now give you guys all enough time to think of some questions does anybody else want to go <laughs> they're silent <laughs> go ahead yeah so um jeff you talked about the notification for land use um development mm -hmm. um if we do a, if we, if the council does a rezone, is there a public notice on something like that? Does a sign go up for anything like that? There is, and that, understand the difference, that's a legislative action, mm -hmm. and that's a certain type of process that we have in our code. Uh, that's not something that my division specifically works with because we're on permits and entitlements. That's a legislative uh, uh, 
of, of action on the part of the council, but there is noticing of, of rezones and those kind of things. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I'll expand upon that a little bit. Be because our zoning matches our comprehensive plan designations exactly, in order to rezone a piece of property in Bothell, you have to request a comprehensive plan amendment. Those can only be done once a year. So we have, uh, it's a different way of doing it, but we don't do site rezones per se, because if you choose to hear and then approve a comprehensive plan amendment for a piece of property, the rezone happens automatically because the zoning has to be consistent with the comp plan designation. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Yep. That's what I think we wiped them out. That was easy. It's only 7.15. <laughs> well, thank you guys. I think that was really informative. And I believe the the slides are on our website somewhere, City Clerk, um, or somebody. Go ahead, Laura. For the presentation, I can, I can put it on the website. I sent it to you via OneDrive yesterday, just so you had a chance to look at it, but I can put the entire presentation on the website tomorrow. Yeah, because we just get a lot of questions about this. It'd be yeah. nice to be able yeah, to, like, hey, go right. see this. And I believe um, we emailed the um, the two-page list of um, resources to you. We did, we? we did not. Okay. I, I did not have time to do it today, but it is on my list to do first thing in the morning. Sorry, Laura. I did yep. send it to you in the afternoon. Yeah. So we have a two-page list of resources that hopefully you'll find very useful. Uh, if you, uh, you want to know more, uh, again, about any of the topics we covered, there is a link to a resource for every topic we talked about tonight. And... Sorry, I was going to say I can also put that on the web. We can put it on the website if, too, as well. It's a good resource both for tomorrow for everyone. I don't know if we have a planning department portion of our website. I'm sure we, we do. do. We yeah. can post it there. We Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I I just noticed that there were a couple slides missing from what we got. Yes, we did. Add so a couple it would be slides. nice we'll to get those. We'll give you an updated version of the um, um, presentation. We'll put that on one drive. Okay. Thank you. So do we want to give the city manager any food for thought on planning for and adding it to our retreat? We have a retreat January 19th. We can discuss it during our one-on-ones if you have additional questions and follow-up. Um, we're hopeful this was helpful um, just to kind of give you a sense of the process. And I really want to thank the planning staff because this was above and beyond on on the 19th, we're going to lament a lot about workloads, um, and this was really an extra effort, an extra project, um, but we really thought it would be helpful at the beginning of the year as you think about the things that you want to um, have the Community Development Department work on, and as you look at that docket, the docket, it's just a list of projects, and we wanted to put it in some context for you, so we're really hopeful this was helpful. Oh, go ahead. I just have a question. Um, could we talk, and we can do that at the retreat, talking, because I'm sure the annexation for Snohomish County is huge, but could we talk and get some recommendations from staff on what the trigger is, because I'm thinking about when we're talking, when we're starting to talking about the Siberia planning for Canyon Park, are we going to say, if we annex this part, this would open up for us. So could we get a recommendation on what that trigger is that you would say, let's move up the process for annexing? I don't know what that trigger would be. So I would reverse it around. So as you talk about the things that you would like staff to work on, the council, that's a council policy and a council directive. So if that's a place where you would like staff to do that analysis and bring it back to you during a council meeting to talk about the options of annexation, talk about the history, what happened before, and the options before you as a council as well as the community, that would be a, a, a work project that you, that would potentially come out of the goal setting that you would add to our work plan. So I just want to say, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, working with you guys, uh, especially your department. It's, um, I, I can't remember, is it over a century of experience am amongst them? Is that what, is that what the, the calculation is? Yeah. So I just, I just think that's super impressive and I just wanted the public to know that, that um, our, we're in good hands when it comes to, to the planning department. You, you, 
I don't know any other city that's got uh, that many seasoned, uh, well-versed, experienced uh, planners all under one one group. So I, I just really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this and, and hanging in there with us. I know that sometimes the planning department gets not beat up by the council, but uh, you know, in general, the public, you know, they've, 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 like we talked about earlier, they just feel like, well, I just want everything to stay the same as it's always been, and you guys have to break the news. So um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you guys uh, working for the city of Bothell as long as you have, and and taking the time to do this. So, okay, yeah. Um, let's see. We did not need the executive session, correct? Is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councilmember McNeil, second by Councilmember Agnew. Any discussion on the motion tonight? No, no, no discussion. No discussion on the motion. Go ahead, and place your vote. We did it too fast. There we go. Go ahead, and place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously with Deputy Mayor Dewar and uh, Customer McCullough, absent and excused. Uh, have a good evening. We're adjourned.